Thank you for joining us on Monday morning for our uh, COVID-19 uh, Monday morning roundup for March 29th. My name is Eric Daly. I am an attorney in uh, Miller Johnson's corporate and business law section. And I'm joined today by my partners, Tim Goodwald and CJ Schneider. Got a few different topics lined up to cover today. And before we jump into the listed topics for today, I did just want to take a moment to mention, and I um, we didn't list it in the agenda, nor do we have anything commemorative planned for this, but uh, I realized Saturday was the one year anniversary of the CARES Act being signed into law. Um, the date that will linger in my mind, uh, March 27th, 2020. Um, that's the date that uh, the CARES Act was signed into law, which put the PPP in the motion, um, a number of other programs that we've hosted many webinars about since then. Um, so it's hard to believe a year has passed since then. And uh, for those who went through the PPP process originally, uh, when it first launched, it'll be about a year and a couple of days here because that program launched almost immediately following the enactment of the CARES Act into law. So uh, just an important milestone to be mindful of, I guess, as we proceed today. So um, having said that, uh, today's topics, we're going to start with the um, kind of an overview of the March 19th and the HHS gatherings and face mask order uh, from CJ. I will then uh, briefly talk about the PPP extension uh, that has now cleared both the House and the Senate and round up a few other small business administration and related updates. Um, and then Tim Gutwald will take us home with some updates on healthcare related funding in the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, and uh, new CMS guidance for nursing homes. So with that, I will turn it over to CJ Schneider. Thank you, CJ, for joining us on Monday morning and uh, sharing your insights into this new, uh, well, relatively new order. I'm good, thanks, Eric, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is CJ Schneider. I'm one of our attorneys in the litigation section. I do quite a bit of work with uh, youth sports organizations, some national governing bodies for sports. And so in my world, one of the questions we've been getting on this new order deals with all of the new testing requirements for youth sports. This is something that's pretty unique to Michigan. And so we wanted to cover these briefly this morning. So the, the major change you'll see in the March 19th order with respect to uh, sports, and this is any sports, whether it's schools or after school activities or nonprofit events, whatever it happens to be, it covers all youth sports. There's new testing requirements. The order goes through a lot of different reasons why it justifies these new requirements, and you'll see some of the statistics up here on the slide. I won't go through them in detail, but uh, there's a viewpoint from MDHHS that there is a rapid increase in COVID outbreaks among participants in youth sports. And so that is what they're using as the factual predicate for a lot of these changes. Next slide, please. So the, the main difference, well, there's two different buckets of sports in the order. It distinguishes between what it calls contact sports and non-contact sports. That distinction isn't new. That existed under some previous versions of the guidance. It's the testing requirements for each of those things that is new, but I wanna kind of start from a baseline here. So contact sports are exactly what you'd think they are. They are those involving more than occasional and fleeting contact with other participants. And you can see the whole list of them up there. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious some of these, right? Football, basketball, rugby, et cetera. I wanna draw your attention to the last clause because this is not an all-inclusive list, right? Any other sports meeting those criteria. So while there's an example list that's put here, it's not all-inclusive and there could potentially be other sports that qualify as contact sports that would then have to comply with the stricter testing requirements. Non-contact sports are everything that isn't a contact sport. That, that part's pretty straightforward, but the big question is gonna be what is a contact sport? Next slide, please. So for non-contact sports, um, 
there's a change, but it's not huge. So as always, you got to comply with any of the face mask requirements. So they got to wear, a, you know, athletes have to wear a face mask at all times, except in activities where they're not able to be worn safely. Everybody's got to maintain social distancing. That part's not, not new. What is new is the weekly testing requirements. And so under the new order and the guidance that goes with it, there are weekly testing requirements for all participants ages 13 to 19. And that's before they can participate in either practice or competition. So this isn't just for your you know, Saturday morning competitions. This is for weekly practices, you know, three-time weekly practices, whatever it happens to be. You got to have weekly testing requirements. And it's for any athlete ages 13 to 19. So this is the new baseline in terms of youth sports. At a minimum, if you're a non-contact sport, and that's everything that is in contact, right? So at a minimum, athletes are getting tested weekly for COVID at this point. And then the guidance goes into a whole lot of detail about what happens if there's a positive test or if somebody returns a neutral test. I mean, there's a whole bunch of detail that goes into it, uh, which we won't cover this morning. But, but the key part here is the baseline testing is a weekly testing requirement for everybody 13 to 19 years old. Contact sports uh, are, are the, the different bucket here. So these are the sports where you have to test much more frequently. Under the order, you got to either wear face masks during contact sports, which by definition is a sport you're probably not going to wear a face mask during, or you have to comply with the new testing requirement. And this is where it gets a little, little onerous, at least in my view. So any unmasked activities in practice or competition have to be, can only be performed after you have either a uh, negative antigen test within the preceding 24 hours or a negative RT-PCR test within the preceding 24 hours of the unmasked practice or play. And I underline that part because I think that's going to have an impact on things like multi-day competitions. If you have a weekend long competition, it's not just from the start of the competition, it's from any unmasked practice or play. So if the competition starts on a Friday and you know, you're competing on a Saturday or your kid's competing on a Saturday or they're competing multiple days, you may have to have multiple tests within those 24, 72 hour windows in order to comply with this new requirement. The number of tests required on each athlete is capped at three times weekly. So any given athlete only has to test up to three times a week under this new order, but that's still a pretty significant uh, number of tests. If you have a you know, team of 15 kids or something like that, this can become difficult very quickly. So big picture, baseline is testing weekly. If you're involved in a contact sport, you've got to test up to three times weekly before any unmasked practice or play. This is the part where the order and the guidance get a little bit murky. So the order is very clear. It distinguishes between contact and non-contact sports. <clears throat> when you read the guidance that came out the day after the order, the March 20th interim guidance for uh, athletics, it kind of suggests this third category. It talks about activities when a face mask cannot be used. And it lists uh, what it terms contact sports or activities that are not recommended to be performed while masked by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And then you can see the lists that are included there, competitive cheerleading when tumbling, stunting or flying, gymnastics while on the different apparatuses, wrestling during contact and water sports. So those are things that don't necessarily fall into the definition of a contact sport, but they fit this notion of activities when face masks cannot be used. And based on our reading of the order and the guidance, it's not totally clear whether these activities are subject to the weekly or the tri-weekly testing requirement. So at least what I've been telling clients is, look, err on the side of caution if you're you know, risk adverse and you wanna make sure you're complying. So meaning test three times weekly, or you can contact your attorney for an opinion. We can parse through uh, the guidance in the letter for your specific situation and potentially issue an opinion letter. But, but there is a little bit of gray area for some of these uh, sports or activities that are not clearly contact or non-contact sports given some of the language in the guidance. Next slide, please. So this is a question I get rather frequently. Who's responsible for compliance with all these testing requirements? And the short answer is pretty much anybody involved in overseeing uh, the sporting events. So sports organizers, venues, and teams must ensure compliance with the new order. And, and that's not new, uh, but the testing requirements are new. So some of these organizations are, are you know, starting to realize that they, they have to procure tests and comply with all the requirements for testing and reporting tests and all that good stuff. Sports organizers are essentially a governing body for a sport, and, and those can take on different forms, whether at the national or local level. 
uh, but basically anybody who's involved in organizing sports, the venue where sports take place, or the sports team themselves have to ensure compliance with the order. So the next question becomes, how do we comply with the testing requirements? And these four points are straight out of MDHHS's PowerPoint, and this is what they suggest. It's, it's kind of basic, but this is what they suggest for, for dealing with the testing requirements. You either got to use local testing sites, meaning have it all done offsite, contract with a vendor or lab uh, to run it through your facility, procure your own antigen testing supplies, or you can enroll in the, the Michigan Safer Sports Testing Program and rec request the, ant the antigen testing kits. And I have a star after this one because it comes with a lot of strings. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll go through some of those. So the Michigan Safer Sports Testing Program sounds really good on its face. MDHHS will provide testing supplies at no cost to any sports organi organization that requests it, public, private, whatever, doesn't matter if you're a sports organization and you want the testing supplies, you'll get them for free. But there's lots of strings, right? You got to have all of the compliance pieces in there. You got to have a clear waiver. You got a biohazard waste disposal. You've got to have appropriate PPE. You got to have certified that you and your staff have watched the training videos. You got to, you have to report all positive and negative tests. So you got to report everything and you got to follow all guidelines that are produced by MDHHS. And, you know, look for organizations that are larger, maybe some of this is possible, but for uh, smaller sports based organizations, some of this stuff can get pretty onerous. So uh, we're, we're working with a number of different clients to navigate through these things. The testing requirements are certainly new and they're unique to Michigan, uh, but it's something that the youth sports world is gonna have to deal with uh, going forward into the spring or the summer. And that's all I have for you. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much, DJ. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people, um, whether they, uh, you know, whether they work in that area directly or not, will find that information valuable um, if they have family members, children, others who um, who are impacted by that. And uh, we appreciate you, as always, keeping us up to date, um, along with other members of the team on, on the state orders, health, safety, otherwise. And um, to the extent that people have Q&A, we will circle back to that at the end of the webinar. Um, I think everybody who's on the line today, CJ, Tim, and I all have the availability to stay on. I think we'll have extra time here. Um, so if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box. My, my update will be pretty quick today. Um, there wasn't a ton of news in the small business funding area, although the what news did come out was pretty significant uh, in as much as now the, the Senate has approved an extension of the PPP loan application deadline through May 31st uh, this year. Uh, I'm not aware of it being signed into law yet, but it's possible that's happened and I missed it. Um, the White House did previously signal well, they didn't signal, they announced publicly that they supported the extension after it passed the House of Representatives and the Senate merely approved the version that the House passed. So there were a couple of amendments to that version that were brought to the floor for a vote, um, each of which, I think there were two proposed amendments, each of which was uh, voted down. So uh, the House version ultimately did clear the Senate with, I believe, uh, 92 in favor, seven opposed vote. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't really close at the end of the day, whether, um, whether Congress would provide this extension. And we talked last week about some of the reasons for the extension. A lot of it has to do with um, technological issues, logistical issues that SBA was trying to deal with that were holding up processing loans. Um, and all this new technology launch um, sort of aligned with the change in administration and some turnover at SBA, as well as the launch of other new SBA relief programs like the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program and, uh, and then on top of that, there were some rule changes and priorities rolled out uh, by the Biden administration for smaller borrowers and sole proprietors. All of this created an atmosphere where um, 
you got to the point where larger banks like Bank of America and Chase said, hey, we're we're actually a few weeks ago, they said we're not going to process any more new loan applications well before the then ex existing March 31st deadline. And we're not going to process uh, sole proprietor applications based on the new, more favorable lending criteria. So now that now that there's this two month extension for applications through May 31st, I believe both of those banks in particular have announced that they will fully reopen their loan application portals. I don't know if it's been completed yet, but they have said they plan on doing that. And um, I believe that they each also plan now on uh, implementing the more favorable sole proprietor uh, lending formula based on gross income. So if you work with any of the big banks or banks that were sort of dragging their feet on whether they'd accept new applications, um, this, this two month extension should be coming into effect soon. And um, in addition to that, the SBA and lenders now will have, assuming this gets signed into law as passed, they'll have an additional two, uh, excuse me, additional 30 days after that May 31st deadline uh, to finalize the processing of any loan applications that were um, submitted and approved by the lender before that May 31st expiration date. So SBA will be able to work in the month of June with lenders to, to just kind of cross T's and dot I's on uh, materials that were properly submitted before May 31st. Um, having said that, uh, the remaining PPP appropriations, roughly 75 billion, um, are unlikely to last until May 31st, according to testimony from uh, an SBA official last week in the, the Senate. Um, the Senate Small Business Committee or subcommittee had a a meeting before this PPP vote was taken and they collected some information from SBA and they provided some feedback to SBA about the, the timing of the rollout of various programs. Um, so it was actually a pretty informative uh, hearing uh, and set of testimony. So the upshot of this particular bullet point is basically that although the program, the application deadline has been extended through May 31st, um, would-be borrowers should not assume that appropriations will be available until that date. Um, in fact, it's likely that, that they will be exhausted before then, and um, the, the latest legislation really just extended dates for the program. There were no new appropriations. There were no substantive changes to PPP. So once that existing you know, set of appropriations is is used and spoken for, it would take, you know, a new act of Congress and, uh, you know, either the White House signing into law or having sufficient votes to override any executive opposition for uh, a veto to, to appropriate new money to the PPP. So while there's some additional time here, um, if you're an applicant who has just become eligible or who um, may just now be moving on a second PPP loan. You know, you don't want to wait around too long. Um, so that's on the PPP. That's the main update. Uh, just a couple of other pieces of information that some of our clients uh, who are PPP borrowers already may find interesting are that the total dollar amount of PPP loans under review did increase modestly on a week over week basis um, last week relative to the week before. However, if you look at the um, number of and the dollar amount of loans in the SBA backlog that are not yet submitted for um, SBA review or forgiveness approval, that amount has been decreasing while the forgiveness amount under review is held relatively stable. So it does seem like, like at least some loans are passing through that review phase um, of the SBA process. Um, I don't think it's, you know, in main the larger loans because it's not a huge 
huge impacts on the dollar amounts in any particular bucket, but it looks like the SBA is kind of working through some of that backlog. And as I mentioned earlier, we're approaching the one year anniversary of the PPP launch. Um, for those who were involved uh, in that, either as an applicant or an advisor, I'm sure you'll remember what a hectic uh, time that was. So hopefully uh, things will, will be a little smoother as we approach the conclusion of the PPP um, and kind of pivot more toward the forgiveness side of things. Um, okay, moving on from PPP, on the shuttered venue operator grant side, um, SBA is still targeting a launch of their application portal. This is the grant program for um, movie theaters, live performance venues, theaters, museums, um, live venue promoters, zoos, things like that. The, the portal is still not very functional right now, but the portal is up um, and it will, in theory, the plan is launch on April 8th. Um, SBA did post some updated FAQs around this time last week uh, for this program, some of which are pretty technical um, in terms of eligibility and things that will be required uh, from applicants. So if you're thinking of applying or you may be eligible, uh, you know, definitely go to the SBA website and review this information. There's some steps that you ought to take if you haven't already in order to get registered as a potential federal grant recipient. So there's there's definitely action items to take ahead of that April 8th date if you're planning on applying for a shuttered venue operator grant. And one of the actions you should take if you plan on applying or are interested in learning more about this program is attending a national webinar that the SBA is hosting tomorrow afternoon. Um, I believe it's around three or 3.30 Eastern time. I'm, I'm planning on attending. So if there's anything interesting there, I'll report it back uh, either via client update or one of our, our other um, webinar media um, options. But if you're definitely planning on applying, you should participate in that webinar to get an overview of this new portal and the application process. And you can register for that. It's free webinar on, on the SBA's website. You can find the registration information. Okay, moving on from shuttered venue grants to the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Um, there, SBA is targeting a 30-day, this is again according to the testimony of the SBA uh, official who we provided some testimony to the Senate Small Business Subcommittee uh, last week, targeting a quote unquote 30 day time frame to launch the restaurant grant program, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund or RRF. And um, that would put the launch of that program sometime shortly after the launch of the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program um, in, in early to mid April. And it's interesting to note, it really appears that SBA uh, is leveraging some of the lessons learned during the, the prolonged time to set up and roll out the SBOG, the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program, uh, to get this restaurant revitalization fund going. I think they're working more closely, it seems, with the restaurant industry to facilitate getting um, organizations registered and eligible to receive funds and also to work with systems and technologies that are already in place, like point of sale information systems, for example, to collect the necessary information to calculate the amount of uh, the grant so as not to create too much of an additional um, calculation or um, document or information production burden on restaurants. So it will be interesting to see how this compares to the Shuttered Venue Program once some more public facing information rolls out. Um, so that's that's largely something to watch. I'm sure we'll have another update on that next week. And then the last point that I wanted to touch on is um, some changes that the SBA announced to their economic injury disaster loans or EIDLs. Uh, some people may have already been familiar with this product. Um, it predated COVID, but it was typically used for things like 
um, in the aftermath of, say, a tornado in a particular region or a hurricane. You know, there'd be a designated geographic area by uh, SBA that was like eligible for these types of loans. Uh, quickly, on the pretty pretty quickly after the national COVID emergency was declared around this time last year, SBA made basically a nationwide eligibility determination for these idle loans. And people may be familiar with that phrase or that acronym from the idle grant program, which is um, just one aspect of the economic injury disaster loan. That's the a grant program where SBA basically pre-funded up to, I think, $10,000. And now it's actually for some of the really small businesses, the grant amount potentially is $15,000. Um, that was a, you know, non, it was, it was basically money in the pocket of the applicant for this loan that did not have to be returned, even if the loan was denied, or if the applicant decided not to take the loan, it was an advance what this news relates to is actually the the loan itself, so an amount that you would have to pay back as a borrower over time, but on very favorable terms. The SBA has increased that loan limit um, and the economic injury time frame for these loans, and I believe the prior loan limit was uh, $150,000, and it's being more than tripled, I believe, to $500,000. This is not one that we've recommended as much, or uh, we're not really in the business of recommending loan products one way or the other, but one that we haven't spent as much time working on, I'll say, because uh, it's, other than the grant aspect that I mentioned, it's not a forgivable loan or a grant like the other programs. It's one that does need to be repaid. But as businesses have, you know, kind of worked through their PPP loan eligibility or may determine that other funding sources may or may not be available, this is another potential um, another potential small business administration source of funding that we did want to call out um, again, given the increased borrowing amount here um, that may be useful for some borrowers, so some businesses. So that's really the main update on, on SBA and small business funding issues. I am going to uh, stay on the line um, through the end for Q&A, but for now, I'm going to turn it over. Oh, uh, before I turn it over to Tim, I'm sorry. I did want to not to scare PPP borrowers too much, um, but people ask a lot about, you know, what's going on with enforcement. You know, they see some of the headlines um, about PPP fraud. And uh, these are some of the headlines from the last week. Uh, the SBA, Watchdog did receive, they said, more than a million referrals of potential fraud for disaster loans. By comparison, the DOJ announced that it has uh, charged, you know, only quote unquote about 500 people with fraud schemes. Um, so there, it just, I guess, goes to underscore the huge amount of genuine fraud, um, you know, and schemes, you know, really. Think you know, kind of criminal organized crime uh, networks uh, setting up entities or using existing entities, identity theft, things like that to procure PPP loans fraudulently, and um, kind of the reinforcement effort, which um, I think is going to focus on a lot of those types of things first. Um, you know, we, we get inquiries from people who are naturally concerned about the forgiveness process and how long that's taken and whether the SBA is, you know, reviewing their good faith need certification more closely. And so one of the reasons I wanted to call out these headlines is more to not to scare people, but actually to let them know that I think by and large, the SBA is mostly focused on you know, what what we would consider true fraud and criminal activity related to PPP. Not that they may not eventually get around to pursuing some of the gray area cases where um, borrowers took a more aggressive position on their need certification or eligibility. Um, but I did just want to kind of provide an update if, if folks were wondering about kind of what's going on on the enforcement side. The DOJ did announce last last week that they were taking action, not only on the PPP, but also on um, the idle grant advances that I mentioned earlier and other 
um, other federal um, disaster relief programs. So uh, I'm sure this will be a, an ongoing theme, uh, unfortunately, for some time after uh, these programs end. So we'll continue to monitor that and our, our litigation team, just so you know who's involved in the PPP uh, teamwork that we're doing here at Noah Johnson is also tracking and what I would consider the more interesting cases for our clients who, who aren't the ones who are out there kind of uh, taking out loans to purchase a Lamborghini, say, but um, trying to track the ones where there's more of a, you know, a dispute about actual eligibility or the need certification, closer calls like that. So we'll keep people posted as, as more interesting cases like that work their way through the system, if any. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Tim uh, to talk about some of the healthcare related uh, funding updates and the new CMS guidance for nursing homes. All right, thank you, Eric. Uh, as Eric said, I'm gonna kind of focus on two, two areas. I don't think it'll be too long. We've kind of going back in a bit of a, the time machine here to, to address both of these again, as everyone's aware, you know, the American Rescue Plan was passed earlier this month. Uh, we, I didn't think there was necessarily, you know, earth shaking news and funding there for healthcare, for healthcare providers. So we kind of put this a little bit on hold, but I think it's a good time to kind of visit this and go over the high points on, on this. And as well, also earlier this month, CMS came out with some additional guidance for nursing homes. Uh, the MDHHS, a more recent order, which we did send, send the client alert on, uh, really just completely deferred to the CMS guidance. So um, we'll, we'll address that and make sure everyone is up to speed on what that requires. All right, so updating on the healthcare related funds in the American Rescue Plan, there's kind of, you know, sort of two different buckets. I think the American Rescue Plan is a little bit different than, say, uh, the CARES Act where we saw significantly larger amounts of money or most of the programs kind of targeting private healthcare providers, whether that be nonprofit or for-profit entities. Most of the money in the American Rescue Plan was uh, dedicated for states and public health departments, you know, tribal uh, Native American tr health entities as well. Uh, as opposed to private providers. But as you can see here, there are, you know, a couple different buckets. Again, the biggest amount of money was to nobody's surprise. And as the administration talked about, you know, leading up to the rescue plan and even, you know, campaigning as well, was for the $7.5 billion dedicated to, you know, distributing, administering, monitoring vaccines, um, obviously, that's been the big push is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And so that's what this uh, large bucket, one of the larger buckets was was aimed at. You know, interestingly, um, there was a billion for vaccine confidence activities. I sort of like like the phrasing of that. It's a good sort of political phrasing. Uh, and I think, you know, right now there doesn't seem to be the, the focus is mostly on, you know, getting these vaccines out and not necessarily trying to convince individuals who are hesitant to get the vaccine uh, to do so. But I think as time goes on, especially maybe as we get, you know, through May and we have this sort of first wave of individuals being vaccinated that, you know, quickly raised their hand and wanted to jump in line and get an appointment. I think once we pass that, um, there's going to be, I think, you know, polls and sort of informal things I've heard from healthcare providers about their staff is that, we're, you know, we're looking between 30 to 40% of people who are still uncertain uh, about the vaccine. And I think that's what we'll see um, in a month or two here, some of this $1 billion going out to, to encourage people to get vaccines, provide some, you know, education, uh, that sort of thing as well. Uh, another big chunk of money, a uh, 47.8 billion, was again for contact testing, contact tracing, you know, mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Uh, there's been so much focus over the last, you know, month or two here um, regarding vaccination and administering vaccines that, you know, obviously still testing, contact tracing continues to go on. We've seen an uptick here in Michigan. Uh, over the last um, week or two. So obviously these activities are still rather important. You know, I'm the parent of uh, a, a number of kids, so I'm still, we're still getting on every day and, and um, 
indicating and stating, you know, my kids don't have symptoms. You know, when we come into the office here at Miller Johnson, we're doing the same thing here. If people are positive, then the public health department is continuing to, you know, follow up with those people and perform the contact tracing. So again, there's a lot of money obviously distributed towards that as well. Uh, another thing for states and public health departments was this expanding, sustaining the public health workforce. I mean, I think that's kind of the three biggest buckets that you see dedicated toward American rescue plan here. Well, maybe a fourth one that we'll get to on the next slide, but is, you know, vaccination, um, continue to do, you know, testing, contact tracing, that sort of thing. And then the third one is just additional money to bulk up the public health force as well. And so, you know, that's one of the areas, again, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning here that, you know, those first three there are really targeted towards states and public health departments again, public governmental entities as opposed to private healthcare providers. That doesn't mean to say that um, there can't be teaming up of the state with, pub with private um, actors or public health departments teaming up with private providers. You've seen that. We've seen that here in Grand Rapids with the um, you know, Spectrum and St. Mary's and Kent County Health Department are teaming up to you know, have a big vaccination site down at Van Andel. And so we've... Um, or sorry, DeVos, I think. Um, so we've seen that here as well. So some of that money will, you know, find its way down to providers, I, I suspect, but um, the 7.66 billion specifically includes, you know, bulking up the workforce for nonprofits profits with demonstrated expertise in public health. So that's one of the areas where the statute specifically allowed money to go to, you know, non-public entities. Uh, also, uh, you know, there's 80 million for mental health and substance use disorder treatments. Again, that was another area here um, with where there's a significant amount of money dedicated was mental health. Uh, I, I, you continue to see dead or headlines about, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. You continue to see, hear, see and hear deadlines or headlines, sorry, regarding um, continued overdoses and the issue with um addictions to controlled substances. So there's significant money uh, put towards that. And again, there's $40 million for promoting mental health among health professional workforce. Um, I saw, I think it was last week, there was an article by CNN that came out talking about concern by hospitals over their workforce, just burnout, stress. I think that's very obviously understandable. Um, I think those of us you know, who aren't in the, in the workforce are very well aware of the stress and the difficulties that um, our, our frontline healthcare providers have experienced over this course of this entire year uh, and that there's burnout. And so the government did devote some money for healthcare providers, private providers can use that money towards improving the mental health among the professional workforce. Again, we'll, you can continue to see the, uh, the sort of dichotomy here, again, on the state side, there was money for community health centers and community care. Again, this was this was really related to COVID-19 testing and vaccines. And some of this was, a lot of this was tied very clearly to COVID-19, but there was, as I mentioned, you know, that 40 million that I just went over for um, mental health for the health professional workforce. Again, that's not so clearly tied to COVID-19, you know, testing, that sort of thing. Again, 1.5 billion to community mental health services and another 1.5 billion for prevention and treatment of substance abuse. So as I mentioned, that's a, it was very clearly an area of focus, concern about the impact of COVID-19 as well as the ongoing um, you know, substance abuse, controlled substance concerns. Uh, you know, 40 million for uh, substance abuse among health professional workforce. Again, that's something those of us who do licensing matters, um, who work with, you know, hospitals and health systems, and, you know, you continually continue to see these sort of issues among healthcare providers. The state has uh, the HPRP program that, that helps providers seek treatment and self-report for those sort of issues. And again, and some more money, again, this 80 million for mental health and substance abuse disorder treatment is one of those areas where there were was specifically allowed to be used for private healthcare providers. That money can go there. 
Um, and then this last one I did want to touch on, there was 8.5 billion for rural for the rural relief fund. And we've seen this a couple times, you know, in the CARES Act, we have the provider relief fund that could go to rural uh, health uh, providers. And I think the important thing here with this uh, in the Rescue Plan Act was it's just a very broad definition of, of what constitutes rural health, you know, provider or supplier who's located in a rural health area, provider treated as located in a rural health area. So there's certain statutes that even if you're not necessarily located outside of a metropolitan statistical area, you might be treated as a rural nonetheless. Um, you know, rural health clinics certainly uh, a provider or supplier that furnishes home health, hospice, or long-term services and supports in an individual's home located in a rural area. So again, I mean, I think that's pretty common for a lot of our clients who, you know, maybe their main office or their practice location is not in a rural area, but they regularly treat individuals that are in rural areas. So they might be, they could possibly receive some of these funds. I think, um, it's not exactly clear, again, it's how this will happen, whether it's going to be applied. Some people seem to think there's gonna be an application, but the language within the statute itself is very similar to what we saw for the Provider Relief Fund back in the CARES Act. That also seemed like maybe there was gonna be an application process, but what ultimately happened was this money was just distributed by the government and um, based on various formulas. So, uh, you know, my guess is that is how this will end up being distributed is would be more related to um, similar to what we saw with the CARES Act and the Provider Relief Fund, where you will um, have to attest and agree to comply with certain conditions, including attesting that you're eligible for these funds, that you meet one of those definitions that I went over, and then that money would be distributed by via some formula. Um, touching briefly on the Provider Relief Fund, uh, you know, a I think it was probably about two months ago, I touched base on the fact that the portal for reporting, um, the reporting requirements for how you've used your Provider Relief Fund money had been shut down. It's still not open yet. Um, no idea when that's going to going to reopen. But, you know, again, I'm still advising clients to get their ducks in a row so that they should be they can report those once that, that money, once those provider, once that portal is reopened. All right, next slide. Hey, uh, hey, Tim, this is Eric. Just real quick on this topic um, in general, before we move on to the next slide, because it's a question we get a lot, or at least we did early on, but it's good to clarify that um, none of these programs really have any direct interaction, as far as I know, with the PPP um and similar programs so uh, unless you want to call out anything different i somebody who works a lot with ppp borrowers and sometimes gets the question about whether that will make them ineligible for any of these funds or vice versa um I, there's nothing in the statute on the ppp side that would make that the case and i just want to double check with you that that's still the case on the kind of on your side of the analysis Yes, Eric, that's a, that's a good point. That is a question we get often. And the answer is you're getting these funds does not make you ineligible for PPP loans. There's nothing in the statute that, that would indicate that. All right. All right so okay. Gonna, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the new CMS guidance for nursing homes, uh, you know, there's nothing earth shattering here. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the most recent MDHHS order really just points you and links you to the CMS guidance. Uh, and we've seen a, an evolution from these. Again, there's initially some guidance in March of 2020, then there was a f FAQs in June, um, and we, we have for a while now been operating based on the September 2020 guidance, and then again, earlier this month, the CMS just issued some, some new guidance, So, and they, they helpfully highlighted the new language in red, which is always nice for those of us um, who can't remember exactly what was in the September guidance to compare. So again, outdoor visitation is still preferred even if residents and visitors are both vaccinated. I think everybody's happy that we've had some nicer weather around here that certainly makes it easier and safer for um, residential living facilities. And you know, I, I did a webinar a while back again, so this is gonna be homes for the aged, assisted living, um, 
obviously nursing homes will be included, foster care homes as well. Adult foster care facilities would be included among that. Again, outdoor visitation is still preferred. And one of the things that I thought was interesting here is, you know, I mentioned should allow indoor visitation at all times and for all residents, except for a few, you know, high risk scenarios. Um, you know, again, it emphasized here that sh it says should. And one of the other things you, you see in the guidance is the acknowledgement by CMS that this has been difficult on residents and family members who have been unable to visit. I think we've all seen those pictures of people kind of talking through windows, standing outside windows. And so CMS has acknowledged that that's difficult and it seems to be willing, especially now that vaccination for individuals in nursing homes has largely been rolled out, that it's okay. You know, we need, to, people should be allowed to see family members and have visitors. So again, the situations where they want people to exercise some caution uh, is where unvaccinated residents in a county with positivity rate over 10% or where there's, um, you know, this isn't on the slide, but the other component in that sort of high risk scenario is where there's less than 70% of residents within a facility have been vaccinated. Hopefully we don't have a lot of facilities like that. Again, obviously people within nursing homes, there is targeted vaccination efforts there and they've been eligible for quite a while now at this point so hopefully there's we don't have too many homes or places where it's under 70 percent you know residents with a confirmed COVID-19 infection should not be um, meeting you know vi having visitation or residents in quarantine as well those are kind of high risk scenarios where maybe uh, indoor visitation might not be permitted and they're still recommending social distancing. So during these visitations, people ideally would be, you know, obviously wearing masks and sitting six feet apart. That said, the guidelines did make it very clear that, you know, again, this has been difficult. And so for people who have been vaccinated, uh, they're allowed to, you know, hug and touch and be and be closer to visitors than has been permitted sort of in the past, or I guess I should say advised in the past. I mean, it's frankly a little weird to, to see guidance from the federal government saying oh, it's okay to touch somebody, but I think we can all understand the reasons for those precautions in the past. And, but it is nice to see, you know, now that people have been vaccinated that uh, it's okay during these visitations to, to be hugging people and, and allow, and not necessarily require that social distancing the entire time. And we'll, we're going to wrap up with this. I'm pretty sure it's my last slide, although famous last words. Again, there's new guidance on the indoor visiting during an outbreak. So, you know, the stuff that I covered already is if there's no positive cases in the facility, remember an outbreak is a new confirmed um, positive case. And so again, if that happens, then the guidance from CMS is for the facility to conduct outbreak testing and if the outbreak testing reveals that there's an additional area within the facility or another unit where there is a COVID-19 test, then at that point they should consider um, prohibiting indoor visitation at that point. But again, if, if we're really limited to just one area or one unit within the facility, then visitation can continue in with residents who are not located in that particular unit or area. Again, something that was interesting again test and vaccination should not be required of visitors as a condition of visitation people are going to be you know people would be wearing masks and again social distancing is recommended you still perform the screening so individuals are stating that they don't have any of those symptoms certainly you can offer testing um, but again it, the guidance was that it should not be required as a condition of visitation Again, also the screening visitors, including surveyors, ombudsmen, it was clear they spent quite a bit of time within the guidance, and they've done this in the past as well, that you know these concerns about spreading COVID should not be used to avoid governmental inspections against surveyors or ombudsmen. Um, you conduct screening, you can offer testing, but you can't sort of prohibit people coming in under, except under like extremely uh, unique circumstances. If there's a really bad outbreak, then that might that might justify it, but for the most part, it's going to be, you're not going to be able to prohibit those sort of visitors. 
again, this is this is a repeat from what we've seen in both the prior MDHHS order and in prior CMS guidance, but communal dining and activities, again, are permitted with proper social distancing, masking, and, and hand washing precautions. So, you know, things are beginning to, to return a little bit more to normal within these residential living facilities. Uh, obviously, people want to continue to be diligent, continue to watch the, watch the guidance from both CMS and the CDC, but uh, as vaccination rates increase, hopefully we'll continue to see positivity rates go down and that will make it a little bit easier and less kind of oversight and work for uh, our residential living uh, facility clients. All right, I think that's it for me. All right, um, thank you very much, Tim and TJ uh, for participating this week and also to our attendees uh, for making the time to start their week with us. We, um, we do have one question in the Q&A, Tim, which I'll give you a moment to look at. Uh, while you're looking at that, um, and then I'll, I'll read the question, I, I just wanted to pick up on something that you noted uh, about how strange, uh, and now there's another uh, question for you, I think, CJ, coming into the Q&A, how surreal it is to see laws in some of these areas, right, about touching one another or, um, you know, what, what kind of testing is necessary for, for sporting activities for, for teenagers. Um, it is a surreal environment, obviously, that we find ourselves in as citizens and, you know, in our case, as attorneys. Um, I think a lot of these are legal issues that we never thought, you know, we, we could have dreamed up. Um, when we started practicing law, I know that's the case for me, and I have some some of those examples of things on the small business funding side. Um, I've mentioned a few of them on webinars in the past, you know, like the SBA's PPP rule that's specific, specific to fishing boat operators and how the PPP works for fishing boats. I mean, that was its own standalone rule that came out um, that I never could have dreamed I'd, I'd be looking at. I don't want to, you know, kind of minimize that issue um, uh, for fishing boat operators and owners, because I'm sure it was important guidance for them. But uh the you know the idea that we'd be looking at that sort of thing is um hard to believe and you know in retrospect but here we are and so we're happy to take some of these questions however bizarre it may seem or things we didn't think we'd be asking and answering a year ago or, or i guess longer than a year ago at this point maybe 13 months ago and so in that in that vein tim one question that's been put in the chat or the Q&A box for you, I think, is um, must both residents and visitors be vaccinated for close contact, you know, hugging? Um, I'll put that into the bucket of things that I wouldn't have <laughs> expected to be posed uh, as a legal question, you know, when I first started practicing law, but understand why it's being asked in the current situation. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. Like you said, Eric, it's kind of, you know, we lawyers go around issue spotting. Uh, you know, we get a factual scenario from clients and have to identify, well, so what, what's the legal issues that this factual scenario raises? And, you know, hugging issue spotting is not, not something I anticipated having to do in my legal career. But it's a good question there. And the, the answer is no, the visitors and residents don't, the visitor doesn't have to be vaccinated. It's just a matter if the resident is vaccinated, they are permitted to hug and touch uh, even non-vaccinated visitors. Okay. Um, thank you, Tim. And um, I know we're getting up on time, so I wanna be mindful of that. If we can end early, that's, that's good. We can start our days early um, after this webinar. I know CJ, you've answered an, uh, a number of Kind of follow up and clarifying questions related to the contact sport and, and other sporting related um, safety vaccination masking issues. I don't know if if people can see the Q and A, but I know you, for those who did ask the questions, your questions have been answered by CJ in the text box. So I think you can at, at a minimum see those answers, and perhaps others in the webinar can as well. Um, so please have a look at those. 
Um, so as we part here, I just, uh, I don't see any new questions coming in. I just want to say thank you again to everybody for joining us. And um, I know some people are on vacation this week. Uh, our, our labor and employment team, uh, I think this might be the first roundup. We haven't had a representative from that group on the line. So they do send their best. They'll be back with us, I'm sure, next week. But if you have questions on that front in the meantime, please you know, know that we've obviously got people um, checking their emails and responding to questions. Um, we weren't able to get to a one or two of those in the chat box today just because um, it's a little outside of this group's area of expertise. Um, but we'll have more programming coming up. We'll have another Monday morning webinar next week. And in the meantime, I hope everybody stays healthy, stays uh, safe. And as I asked last week, uh, stay in touch. Um, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.